Welcome back to Mayday. I'm your host, Trevor May, 10-year Major League veteran, and I am excited to rant once again about baseball and the sports world beyond. Today's show is going to cover all kinds of subjects, namely an update on the study done on whether or not the pitch clock hurts your arm or not. We found it or something similar to it, and it might not say what you think it says. Also on the docket is discussing Caitlin Clark's WNBA rookie contract and why Julio Rodriguez has gotten off to such a slow start in 2024. Hello, everybody. Today is April 17th. I noticed that I did not say the date last time, but now that I know that this show is going to come out, I wouldn't use the word uh, sporadically, but I would say you know, not on a consistent day weekly, at least for now. Um, If I get two out a week, I think that is a great rate of of play. I'm, I'm, I'm really trying to just operate on terms of subjects. So when I get three topics to kind of deep dive on that, I'm not going to probably put anywhere else, which is kind of the big, the big barrier to entry guys with these things when like, I want to put out so much stuff, but when it comes to video, it just takes way longer. So you're going to get some a lot of audio, but it seems like people like this. So uh, I, I like it too. I'm having a really good time. So I'm excited to bring this to you on the on, on the regular. Um, always remember, you can get a hold of me or you would like to uh, participate in the show or give me some information or want me to talk about something. You can always talk to me on Twitter. That is I am Trevor May on Twitter. Or you can join the Discord channel, discord.gg slash Trevor May if you can't remember what that is. It will also be in the description. And we have a whole baseball side of that place with all kinds of forums and stuff going on. But there is a channel called Mayday. Mayday is where um, you can have open conversations about the topics that we're talking about on the show and suggest ones that you'd like to hear in the future. There will become a time where I'll uh, I'll let you guys call in and leave some messages and, and include you in the show. That sounds like a, a lot of fun. I've done that before on podcasts. Um, so just give me a little bit of time to make sure that's set up and working correctly before I go and tell you to use it. Because if you guys are all have all these hot takes and stuff and I want to play them in the show and then it just doesn't work, uh, I'll be disappointed. But more importantly, you'll be disappointed. So uh, that is coming, though. That is coming. And I've had a lot of fun doing it. And uh, I'm going to really enjoy doing this. But without further ado, let's just get into the first topic, and it is an expansion on last episode's topic about whether or not the pitch clock is affecting pitchers and their injury rates, because uh, this is probably most likely a timing issue where all these guys are getting hurt while the clock has been changed twice in in two years, and it's mostly a bad look. But, um, you know, whether or not injuries are being caused by pitch clock or or not, or you know, guys throwing harder or sticky stuff or whatever, you know, it's kind of not the conversation or not the, the, the debate that needs to be happening because of course, logically, all of those things are going to have some impact one way, shape or form. And it's not universal for every guy. So certain guys might get hurt from the pitch clock and you'll just never know because they're not in your quote unquote study, a study that was mentioned last time uh, we read last episode, we read the statement put out by the MLB after the MLB PA put out a statement saying the pitch clock wasn't adequately studied and we don't know whether or not it does cause injuries but we're just forcing it in the game anyways that is what it said the response was not to that it was just the no 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 you guys throw too hard that's why you're getting hurt and we've talked to doctors at John Hopkins University and they corroborate our story now doing extensive research or extensive um, study into the effects of the pitch clock it turns out, or it seems to me, because I still am I'm able to find that study, any study done by John Hopkins, I'm coming to the conclusion, I'm starting to believe now, now I don't, this is, this is uh, just me kind of putting pieces together. I just think this is anecdotal interviewing of doctors based on what knowledge they know. So like, then they don't think that it's gonna, it's, there's gonna be any connection. They don't think that, or they haven't seen evidence to make them believe that. That is not the scientific method. That is not good enough. That is not a good representation of your argument. And that does not mean that it doesn't have anything, doesn't affect it at all. That just, that's not what that means. And what that is, is called, it's just dishonest and disingenuous and, and just pointless. It like, you're better off not putting out a statement at all. Just don't, don't engage the situation. Uh, but they just can't help themselves. So, uh, I, I don't, think there is a study that said 
thank you so much on to to uh, my friends on Twitter, and I will make sure that I get your handle in the in the show notes below. Guys, go check the show notes below for the handle of the person that sent this to me. I'm so sorry I don't have it written down, and I'm in the middle of recording, so I can't look it up. But I will give you your due there. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I had actually two people send this over to me. There actually was a study done on the effects of a pitch clock, and it was done in 26. Now, let me give you a little bit of uh, uh, info on this, and I will post the link to this article as well that, that broke this down. Now, you can actually download the official uh, report if you would like to, It's but it's $61. This is how they fund a lot of the research, too. So, like, just know that's where this comes from. And you can read the whole, like, get the whole PDF and read the whole thing. I did not do that because, one, I'm not trained to read that very well, so there's going to be a lot of stuff in there that's just going to be confusing. And, two, there's a bunch of articles been written about it that, that where they did that work. So I'm going to reference those articles instead of going to the exact uh, document itself. But basically, uh, the the title of this article, and I will, again, link uh, in the description, it's from undark.com. Now, you know, I, I, I'll be honest, I haven't read anything off undark.com, but also this was written eight years ago, so there's a chance that this website, you know, was, you know, had people going to it for this type of stuff and it just has kind of slowed down i don't know but this was written in may may 20th of 2016 and is titled the problem with pitch clocks so basically a uh a group of people did a study where they uh they built a computational model for, of muscle fatigue uh where they gathered data on 73 american league pitchers including innings pitch inning pitches per inning time between pitches and the type of pitch thrown fastballs uh, and breaking balls, uh, and basically just scraped all this data off of uh, fan graphs and then uh, cross referenced, you know, guys missing time and things like that. Uh, so, and simu uh, it basically simulated how fatigue set on the muscles used to stabilize their elbows. So, this is specifically like in terms of how it would hurt you, Tommy John adjacent, right? So, it this is less about uh, shoulder and more about elbow. And according to this article, the shorter the time between pitches this study found, the higher the muscle fatigue and the more strain placed in areas like the UCL. Now, anyone who isn't familiar with how the UCL works, the UCL is not a muscle. It is a tendon that is functions like a seatbelt for your elbow. It keeps basically uh, the elbow bending and uh, uh, functioning and moving the correct way. It's like a guide, okay? So the problem with when you tear your UCL is that elbow becomes unstable um it's very similar to like acls mcls and like meniscus in your knee there it's a much bigger ligament but it functions kind of the same way trying to get that joint moving the way it's supposed to like it's anatomic uh, um wow I, I can't believe i just stumbled over that word so bad anatomically correct there we go i did it so basically the muscles around both inside and outside up your tricep um up your bicep like all these muscles they basically cross over into the elbow and then move into your forearm so like there's all of these different muscle groups that are connecting around the ucl area generally so if you get certain fatigue in one side or the other uh, one pulls and the other one isn't pulling or holding very well they're not parallel or they're not mirroring each other um, in terms of force then you start to have ucl problems Part of that is is a cool down period between stressing all those muscles like in a explosive manner and then cooling down. So what happens is uh, when you lower that time, the chances that your muscles fatigue quicker and you but you don't necessarily register that fatigue because it's it's kind of a subtle it's a subtle change like you're used to it. Um, then you can put your strain on UCL and not under, not really feel it until it goes. It's not something that like stretches 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 and then tears. It's something that like it's stress and hold steady, hold steady, and then it just kind of pulls apart like a seatbelt would. And that's actually, that happened to me. That's how I know so much about this, uh, that my doctor, Dr. Meister, who actually just did Strider, uh, is very explicit about explaining what's going on, um, which, you know, is awesome, but also can be a little, uh, you know, off-putting if you if you just went into surgery. But, you know, it's he's a man that that loves his his work and does amazing job. And he just genuinely has this, this level of passion for, like, fixing fixing athletes that I've never seen before. So I, I have nothing but great things to say about Dr. Keith Meister because he is a legend. So basically <laughs> this study, uh, and it is done by a college out of Canada and it was published in March in the journal of sports scientists. So this is a public, this is a public published case study. 
Okay. And it says, basically, we are all aware that UCL tears are on steady rise in baseball. And if the loads of the UCL increase due to initiating pitch clock, we may see that continue. Said Stephen Thomas, assistant professor of kinesiology who studies throwing injuries at Temple University's College of Public Health. This study does bring, bring to light the potential harm that can occur with this potential rule change. So there has been a study. That study has been published, and that study found the exact opposite of what Rob said. Take with that and do with it with what you will. There is a study out there, and they they I understand seventy five pitchers in the American League. There could you could do a bigger sample size. You could do it over several years, and you could do it with the minor leagues. But until I see that as a published public study with an actual like document for me to read. I just, I, sorry, Rob and whoever's writing the statement, I'm just not going to take your word for it. So it's uh, the finger pointing again is, is silly. It's silly and dumb. And, uh, you know, you, it, it's, it's just, it kind of brings me to the, to that final conclusion I had last time. And this is, you know, to wrap up real quick on this subject, are they going to do anything about it? If you're denying that it, that it even is affecting anything, so no, no, it's not going to be done. If anything's going to be done, it's going to be done. Uh, the players are going to need to do something to fix it. Um, and it's going to be something that 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 is put in place to restrict a, something from that side, as opposed to restrict rule changes. It won't be rule change involved because they just they won't give leverage. They just want to be able to do the things they think they need to do in order to uh, continue to build the economics of the game. And that's the way it is. So just understand when you see uh, something from that from from the from the commissioner's office that is touching on subjects like this. It's it's always going to be number one profit centric and there will be there will be thoughts about the players up to a point that the pr that is good enough and then the rest will move it's just that is that is the order of operations um in, in the uh in the office there so awesome you like candy do you like caffeine well, then you'll love Focus Fuel, a company that a bunch of my creator friends and I have teamed up to uh, promote and get out there, and it is awesome. I love this stuff so much. Each piece has 50 milligrams of caffeine in it, comes in three delicious flavors, watermelon, tropical punch, and blue raspberry, electric blue raspberry. I knew, I knew, I knew. So if you're interested in trying out this delicious product uh, made with all natural ingredients and caffeine derived from green tea and a bunch of other electrolytes and things that make you feel better without the crazy crash, check out Focus Fuel. Go to thefocusfuel.com, use code BASEBALL. That is code BASEBALL for 10% off your order. And uh, let me know what you think because, man, I love it. So in our next segment, I get to talk about something that isn't baseball related, but is very, very interesting because it actually parallels a lot of the conversations I've had with you guys and been talking about a lot recently. And that is the the, the idea of the CBA, the Collective Bargaining Agreement in professional sports. Pretty much everyone has one, and how players, you know, ask for and continue to battle for pay because professional sports as an entertainment industry are very interesting in that. Um, it's highly specialized and there's very few people that can do it. And the people, for the most part, the people who own the things or are in control of the things and what they're doing, namely teams and the, the leagues and stuff, aren't players or never were players or people who never could do the thing that they own, which is, if you think about it in terms of a business standpoint, an economic standpoint, that's, that's pretty rare. There's not a lot of places you can say that happens, even in like movies and stuff like directors, a lot of times are also actors like they can get out of their chair and go do the thing that they are they are in control of and they are directing. And there's a lot of executive that actually were directors and actors before, too. They there's no there, that's much more like something that happens in that industry than it does in sports. It's just the nature of it. So um, so there is it's a unique approach to revenue sharing and how like how, like that is a unique situation where how do you find a, a, a strike a a nice balance between how much the players are being paid and how much the the owners are keeping and and what's fair and that's always going to change so like whenever you have a cba agreement or, or an argument or a lockout or whatever it's going to be trying to balance that i've talked about this before but just just think of it it makes it very simple there is a there is a percentage going to the players or a percentage going to the to the owners and then 
that's just be trying to be rebalanced based on what are the economics of the time are. So like TV deals change, social media changes, what they're asking players to do changes. Like oh, there's a lot of stuff like nutrition changes, all this stuff. So you got to build things in to, to adjust to those things. And it is healthy, even though it seems like they're button heads and they're yelling at each other. That is an important discourse to have because it keeps things moving forward and keeps kind of both sides generally in better situations than it would have been if one took over and just like ab- abused the other one. So um, I think it's th- the best system there can be because it builds in hard conversations that you have to have. Just like in a relationship, you're going to have to, you're never going to just be able to coast for years and years with your significant other. You're going to have to work through things. Things can be hard sometimes. It's the same thing here. And that's the best way forward. You build a you build a lasting relationship, which I, we've seen for hundred hundreds of years with different sports. So today's topic is about Caitlin Clark. Caitlin Clark is a star. She is Iowa. If you are been living under a rock, she is uh, the all time women's college basketball scoring leader now. I believe she she might have gotten close to Pete Maravich. This is men's and women's. She might have gotten close to Pete Maravich's assist record. Um, I, I or maybe she broke his scoring. Re- I, either way. She she broke a bunch of records. She broke it in startling fashion when she hit a thirty foot, uh, thirty almost at homer, thirty foot three pointer. Um, when she was right there for the record, she's she's a G. It's like she's absolute. She's a star. She's a stud. I would I would argue that she's she's she is the biggest uh, college women's college basketball player of all time. Possibly one of the biggest in either you know either league. And her rival with Angel Reese and Angel Reese has done her own, you know, growth of the game and just turned it into this like, yes, there's lots of drama and yes, it's very chippy and stuff. But like she's just passionate and that's just the brand that is like we live in the Internet age. That's what people watch. And if that's what you're doing and you're comfortable with it and that's the way you like to play that, I love it. I love it because I I just, you know, I love eye rolling. I love getting response, like having a uh, a physical response to to people in sports acting certain ways because that's the point. So, um, but anyway, back to Caitlin. She was drafted first overall and she signed her rookie contract. And that number, now that so many people are paying attention, this is, this is, uh, this is bigger than like, you know, Swifties finding out about Travis Kelsey big. Like, there's people who know Caitlin Clark. My, my wife, Kate, knows who Caitlin Clark is. Like, she could not care less about sports in general at all, ever, like at all. But Caitlin Clark is a stud. And she owns it like a stud, and she's like a great combination of like humble and cocky. It's it's awesome. So she gets drafted first overall. And what is her contract? Her contract is for three hundred and thirty six thousand dollars over four years. That's three hundred and thirty six thousand dollars. The rookie contract is seventy six grand a year. I'm pretty sure like most people who are making seventy six grand a year can't rent their own apartment currently. In most places, like they can't live alone, they would have to get a roommate. So you're telling me the number one overall pick, the most famous women's college basketball player of all time, probably would have to have a roommate if she <laughs> if she was working in like at Amazon. That's crazy. That's crazy to think about. All right, just just on its on its face, that's crazy. That's a that's an extremely low, low number, really in 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 most four year <laughs> four year degree jobs that's kind of like you know you're looking for more than that if you just go get a bachelor's degree in most degrees uh, you're you're looking for more than that because it's just the cost of living so that is one big thing that people notice now just for context let me put this in context for you um any rookie in the major leagues this year any rookie if they're up for all 162 games if they get full year of service time they're going to make twice as much money this year then she is going to make in all four years of her contract. Let me repeat that. <laughs> MLB rookies are going to make twice as much money as her entire contract, $720,000. That is, that's that's a crazy comparison. People are like, oh, Steph Curry's going to make $48 million. Yeah, well, that's the top. Don't take the top, you know, guy to a rookie contract. And that's just not, I understand that number's crazy. Um, he's going to make $48 million this year or next year, and she's going to make... 76,000 next year. Now, are they the same player? No. There is that a weird comparison kind of, but that was the one that I saw all the time on the internet. I think the big thing you need to know about this though is um how the collective bargaining works for the WNBA. A lot of people don't know this. So, here's the main arguments going out there and and they they both have merits, but I know that one's coming from maybe not the most open-minded of places, so we're going to say that that's not as good of an argument, but the the there are, there are a lot of women out there and and rightly so saying these 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 women need to be paid more. I agree with that. They do need to be paid more. More is more is definitely a no brainer. More than that is there's just simply no way they can't afford to pay them more. 
But here's a few things you need to know about the economics of the WNBA and how it happened, how it came to be. The NBA, David Stern started the NBA or WNBA, and David Stern's the who was the who was the commissioner at the time, like basically spun off the WNBA, like uh, like expanded it out out of the umbrella of the NBA. So in 1996, they started it. You know, they, they started with 12 teams. There's still only, I believe, there's only 16 or 20 teams. Like I, I, I am starting to get into it more. And I did buy the WNBA uh, season pass. By the way, highly recommend doing it. It is, it is also on sale. Even if you're not going to watch that many games, it is the cheapest streaming thing, streaming or or sports service you will be able to find if you get season pass for the WNBA. It's like 30 bucks. So uh, go do it. Even if you just want to throw some support and don't actually anticipate uh, watching too much because you have, don't have time or whatever, still worth it in my opinion. I think it's a nice way to do it. But that said, these le- you got to know where they came from. And the league technically, from a expenses to revenue standpoint, has not been profitable yet since its inception. Now everyone's like, okay, why is this league keep going? It's 28 years. Why why is it still going then if it doesn't make money? It's close. I believe last year in 2023 it lost um, 10 million dollars, but but the re- and the revenue was like 82 million. So it was like 82 million, and then it it made 72 million. So like that's that's a pretty like we're getting close, and that number has only gone up. Especially I think over the last five years, it has slowly gotten closer and closer and closer and closer. So the growth is there. And we're going to see the Caitlin Clark effect. We're going to see the Angel Reese effect. We're going to see these college players going on to the WNBA, bringing a lot of their attention with them. And that is, I, I would not be surprised in the next year or two is where we see a first or second profitable year, right? So with that in mind, though, part of their the the expenses of the league are paying the players. So, you, so think of these leagues in terms of closed industry systems. Like MLB is MLB. Like the the only market forces you need to think about are how much money the league is making as a whole, just in the, like the MLB as an entity, how much money is the whole thing making, and then how what percentage of that are the players being paid. That is as straightforward, that is as free market of a capitalistic system as there can be. That is how it's supposed to work. So let's put this in context. I just want you guys to know how these splits work. So let's not think about, oh, this is how much the men are making and this is how much the women are making because they're in different leagues that make that have separate revenue streams. So think about it in percentages of the revenue that that league makes, and that'll even put it in perspective. So in baseball, in the MLB, the split is anywhere from like 48.5% all the way up to 51%, depending on the on the year. Sometimes there's things that kick in later. Sometimes there's special events that where, the, where the split changes and that changes the revenue for the year and stuff. So it floats. It floats anywhere from 48 to 51. Uh, there was a point where it was like 46%, and that's when a lot of the stuff got addressed in, addressed in the CBA. But like, just think about this. It's 46 to 50, generally. Um so the MLB is around there. NBA is 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 forty percent. So the NBA actually historically isn't hasn't had a, a very strong union generally, um, and they're working their way up though. Theirs is getting stronger, and they get about forty percent of the total revenue. The NFL is is anywhere from forty eight to forty nine percent as well. They have made a lot of strides as, as it is too, but they have so many play, There's so many players on every team that this kind of starts to get watered down. So it's not as good for players, but there's just so many players in the league um, as opposed to baseball which is second and then the nba which is third in terms of number of players in the pool so we have 49 or 45 to 50 we have 40 and we have 48 to 49 what is the wnba the wnba is 20 percent. so you're telling me that even though the league's not making money you're only giving the players 20 percent of the total revenue that's that's the problem so Instead of so so let's change this narrative here and I would love I would love your guys' thoughts on this. So again, Discord, Twitter, and uh, uh, we'll continue to have these conversations, but you need to start there, right? Instead of thinking about these things as, oh, um, the men are making X amount of dollars, so the women need to be making either like the same or like what percentage of the men's you know salaries do we need to get to? It needs to be what percentage of the league's revenue. So as that league grows revenue, the players need to benefit from that and the league revenue is going to grow with Caitlin Clark she's going to bring she's she this is kind of a this is a new this is a new age I feel like this is this is their chance and we're, they're gonna, there's more attention going there and it should be and they deserve it when that goes up are they still just going to get 20 percent of it so maybe you know maybe their salaries 
aren't going to be, you know, tens of millions of dollars a year for the best players. That's probably not going to happen just because of how much money the league makes. It's increasing, but it's just not comparable that way. We're not in the billions. We're in the we're in the tens of millions in, in profit or in revenue. But if they were making, say, 45% of the revenue, that minimum wage would not be 76 grand. It'd be 150. Caitlin Clark wouldn't be making, you know, four years, uh, 360,000 should be making four years, 800, 900 million. Now, is that still like a, a, an astronomical large amount of life changing money? It's not, but it's it's definitely a an adequate pay for what the league is making. So as the league's revenue grows, then those players get paid more the same way that it's ha- it happened with all the uh, all the. Uh, men's sports over the years like in the 60s the revenues weren't that big players didn't get paid that much and they didn't have a union like these things had to change over time and the the problem was they started a league from from scratch basically with a model that they already had it didn't happen organically they just tried to make it that way so ladies um next cba negotiations go at them and you want i need you to say i need you to say hey why is our revenue split only half of the men's revenue split that's going to perk some ears, and I, if I, if I were a, a betting man, which I'm not, might become one, but I'm not right now. Um, I would say that uh, that'll perk up some ears, or, or that'll get the attention. I already said perk up some ears. That'll get the attention of the powers that be in a, in a real way, and I think that the uh, the general public would like to hear about that as well. So uh, after some searching on the internet, you can see that yeah, revenue sharing not 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 the same, and if. Maybe we start there. Maybe that's where this this problem starts to get remedied is if at least we can get that balance back. And then that way it makes sense because not only are they not paid very much, the amount they're being paid doesn't make sense based on precedent sent by all of the other leagues. And that is something that should be talked about. Not, not the actual dollar amounts, but the splits. Let me know what you think. Discord, hit me with it, please. And thank you. And now finally, for our last segment, let's get back into baseball and let's talk about Julio Rodriguez. Now, a lot of you know, I live in Seattle. Okay. There's a little bit of hometown uh, homerism going on here. And you know what? It's nice to be able to do that for once because when you're a player, you can't just openly root for your hometown team when you're not on it. And as the whole league knows, and very, very well, Many of the Mariners fans, even people who aren't Mariners fans in the area, know Julio Rodriguez is their big prize, their big star. He signed that huge contract with like two hundred million dollars in incentives, uh, and he's twenty three years old. You know, he's uh, he's got the you know he's like got the the facial hair and the light. Eye. He's just a freaking guy um, that is just meant to be taken photos of. Like he's just he's a star. He's a star in every way, shape or form. And, uh, there has been months of his young career where he's shown that he is the greatest player on the planet. He's one of the streakiest guys I've ever seen, but unfortunately he has started this year to not a great start. Now I'm getting into this a little bit because I've been asked actually four or five different times in different DMS and, and on different forums about what I think's going on with Julio. And, uh, I did some deep diving and it's pretty standard. Um, but I, I, what I want to do with these things and I want to do this regularly is go grab a guy, look at what's going on, what's been going on with them and then see, try to give you a little bit of uh, stuff to look for when their season might turn around or might, they might get bust out of the thing that's, that's bothering them. So really quickly, let's talk about, uh, what Julio does historically. Well, he hits the ball hard. He's always up there in exit velo. He's been in the top 10% of exit velo around the league uh, all three years he's been in the majors. So, like, he just hits the ball hard regularly. Generally, if someone hits the ball hard, the chances that even missed hit pitches or or, or balls that um, that maybe are hit right at people, like, the, you're, they're more likely to get more hits if you constantly hit the ball hard um, or at least do more damage. Like, that's a general rule of thumb. Over 500 at-bats, that's going to produce more hits than, say, an average exit velo would. Uh, he has truly no weak pitch. There's never a pitch that's a glaring hole where you can throw it every time and he'll just miss it. There are guys who are very, very dangerous, but they have a kryptonite. He is not one of those, and that kind of shifts. There's times where he really struggles with the pitch, but he, he tends to close the hole, and he has his whole career. And so there's nothing, especially me as a reliever, when I prepared for a guy, if I found a, a, a hole, I would exploit that hole. That would be my number one goal. Uh, going at him, he is a guy where you can't just find a, a, a hole. There's maybe a pitch you can make a mistake with in certain counts, that maybe he'll miss hit, but there's no hole where you can be like, if I just pepper this spot, he's going to miss it. Aaron Judge has one of those holes. Uh, Julio does not. So it, it's 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 like uh, that's the, that's a sign of a of a potentially like truly great 
you know, all time generational type hitter. And then when he gets hot, like I mentioned before, he's streaky. When he gets hot, nobody gets hotter than that. Like he's like when he goes, he's he's going four for four every single night for a week. Like you don't see guys get twenty hits in a week. Nobody in this league, nobody do that for a very long time. He's one of those guys, and so when he gets in that mode you might as well just not throw him a strike because he's going to hit it. And he might still hit the balls. So good luck. But when he's struggling historically, he starts to chase. And it's usually always, almost 100% of the time, always associated with aggressiveness. He gets wildly aggressive. He tries to do everything himself. And he tries to force things into happening. Now, you hear that all the time, I'm sure, um, you know, he's, he's, he's forcing, he's forcing, he's pressing, he's forcing, he's pressing. He's in a lineup that historically the last couple of years has not been the most consistent, not really the highest powered. And so he feels a lot of pressure to do it himself. So part of his natural way of hitting is to be aggressive. He swings a lot. He swings at first pitch about 50% of the time. He's generally chased almost 30% of the time. So like he's always been this way, um, but not quite at this rate. So, uh, you got to remember that this is just going to be part of his game and it's going to still be, he's going to be still doing this to a level when he's going well. And then uh, that kind of brings me to the, the, the aggressiveness. So when the big moments come up, so like first and second, late in the game, they're down by a run, they're, they're tied, they're down two, whatever. And he's got ducks in the pot and less than two outs. The chances that he's going to swing at that first pitch is almost 100%. He gets wildly aggressive and his at bats are very short. So what he, what he doesn't, do and a lot of people go well is he he's getting his pitch so he wants to swing at it whatever whatever yes those are all those are all important but if you look at guys like uh around the league that are also superstars sotos the judges and the and the the mookies they're very specific they 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 almost get very specific early in that count because if they don't get the pitch they want to hit they want to work that count to the maximum. They want to put as much pressure on that hitter. Because you've got to remember, the pitcher in that situation, say first and second, it's the eighth inning, you're up by a run, you're an eighth inning guy. First and second, you walk the guy, you give up a single, you got one out, a strikeout or something, and uh, now Julio Rodriguez is up first and second. You do not want to throw nine pitches. You do not want to have to like battle this at bat. You want this to be over quick. How Julio operates sometimes is he feeds into that. He like goes up. So comes out of his shoes on a on a pitch that was fine, but he like tried to hit the three and homer, and he pops that first pitch, and then now the pressure is so like he didn't leverage that at bat at all against the pitcher. Guys who do that like chef's kiss like to the T. Juan Soto, he's okay. Three two, fighting, fighting, fighting until he gets the pitch that he wants to hit hard. He never gets it. He'll take his walk. Aaron Judge, he is maybe a little bit more aggressive, and and if you can pepper that hole, like I said, that slider down the way, he probably won't hit it. But he will fight you, fight you, fight you until you do make a mistake. In those situations, the chances a pitcher makes a mistake goes up because of the pressure. You need to be able to fight and fight and fight. You need to extend in the bat to leverage that pressure. And something that Julio has not learned to do at all is leverage the pressure on the pitcher. I don't know why. It's probably because he's 23 and he's young and he's learning. But once he does that, once he once he says, hey, I'm going to make you dial it in and then when you don't i'm going to hit that pitch and it's not going to be the first pitch it's going to be somewhere in the middle of the count that when he does that regularly and sees that spot and then is okay moving the train along and going bases loaded with one out and letting jorge blanco or mitch Haniger or somebody come up and do the job that is that is when you're going to see him become a stud a super mega star a mega mvp every single year type star because he's talented like that now it's funny. I just mentioned Hanniger. He is doing exactly what I just said. He is not doing too much. He is the one. He is the one hitting guys in because he's not trying to. He's got. He's a veteran. He's not trying to do too much, and he's not trying to be. He's not trying trying to uh, live up to being Julio Rodriguez. So here's what he's doing now. He's hitting 206, but he's got a 260 expected average. So obviously underperforming. He's getting a little bit unlucky, which is good. But he's hit, has a 221 slug. I believe he has one double. All the rest are singles, no home runs. Right. 260 on base percentage because he's whiffing. He's chasing so much. He's chasing up and in fastballs, and he's chasing changes below the zone. There's no hits on a changeup this year, and he's f- chasing that that two seam that righties are throwing now to righties up and in. He's swinging at all the time. So even his singles are that pitch. He's going hitting them off the plate up and in. He's getting a single because he's strong enough. But like they they'll be like, okay, cool, take that single. I'm not gonna. The only thing he's hitting is hard is is stuff that's off the plate. If I look at I'm looking at his heat map right now, he's one hit of a ball in the box which is pretty crazy. 260 on base, 
that that will not play. We got to walk more. We got to work counts more. Again, like I said, the stuff that I mentioned before will translate into walks. It's not like I need to walk more. It's I need to do the things to put me in the position to walk when I'm supposed to. That is the way you're supposed to think. That is the way it works. So all of that combined is a 491 OPS. We all uh, obviously don't think he's going to do that all year, but the problem is he's chasing. So when you chase and you're hitting pitches that aren't towards the middle of the box or in the box, that's where your barrel naturally gets to the best. So he's just not getting things on the barrel, even though he is hitting the ball hard still. Like his whiff rate's only slightly up. His chase rate's actually only slightly up from his over his averages. But his exit velos are about the same, maybe slightly down because he's gotten jammed a little bit more. But still, he's still hitting the ball hard. His max exit velo is 115 miles an hour. It wasn't a homer. But he did hit a ball 115 this year already. So there's nothing going on like physically. It's, it's very clear there's no nagging injury. It's just an approach situation. So he's just not working counts because he's pre- he's trying to make things, he's trying to force things happen. And that is his number one tendency as a 23-year-old, right? So I think uh, something to pay attention to, and I want to. this is how I want to kind of end these segments for you. What to look for when he might be turning it around. And this is what's so interesting to me because uh, I think that this was something that I was doing a lot when I was playing and I never really internalized what I was doing, uh, like trying to predict whether like a guy was going to have a big, uh, series based on what he had just done and like kind of his first game. And I kind of could, could feel it out. Like this guy's locked in and he's doing some things. So maybe he's a guy we got to stay away from if he, especially if he's in, isn't the guy that's usually in that lineup that we should stay away from, or we should avoid letting him hurt, kill us, beat us. So when, he, if he starts to use, if he starts to average another pitch in AB, if he starts to work counts a little bit later, even he's getting the same results. If, if there's, if there's a bats are starting to expand a little bit, especially with guys in, uh, score, scoring position. If he starts to have a little bit longer at bats with people on the bases, that signifies a an approach change and a and a he is aware of his being over aggressive and he's tr- he's doing adjustments to fix that. So if you see an adjustment to where he's taking a pitch like one of those up and in fastballs, he takes it or he like gives a check and doesn't swing, especially in advantage counts. If it's like two one one zero oh, two two pitches where he should be able to get something he wants to hit. And he's spoiling them, a really nasty splitter that's on the plate below the zone. Um, and he takes takes something close, and it's like, all right, I got it. That is what you want to look for because now he's a, he, that shows you that he's aware of what he's doing. And when he's aware of what he's doing, he will start to um, shore that stuff in a little bit. So so as the team starts to get a little warmer, so if, say Jorge Blanco warms up a little bit, someone else warms up, um, J, uh, uh, J.P. Crawford warms up a little bit at the plate, um, and starts to get hits start landing in, I think he'll loosen up as well. He's just pressing because no one else is really hitting besides Hanniger. You see these uh, counts starting to lengthen, and then notice when he's walking. So he is walking a little bit more. He started to walk a little more, but when is he walking? Is he walking to start an inning? Because that's different. Guys can do, is it a four-pitch walk, or is it a battle walk? Is he getting 2-2, fouling a pitch off, taking a close pitch, fouling another one off, and then taking ball four like that? Is that the walk, or is it just one, two, three, four, because the guy's scared of him? Like, those walks are different. Those walks tell you different things about the approach. And so pay attention to the battle walks, the walks that are six, seven, eight, nine pitches long and then end in a walk where he's willing to take the walk, especially when somebody's on base. And then pay attention to how hard he's hitting the ball. Um, if he's still getting out and you see, you know, three exit velos, 100, 100 miles an hour or, or higher, that means he's hitting pitches that he can handle well and he can hit hard and they're just not falling that falls eventually those things start, those things turn into streaks so if you see high exit velos but he's over be encouraged by that if he is an over but he's walked two times and those are expanded at bats uh where he 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 worked the count another thing to pay attention to because he's about to turn around it's just all about aggressiveness it all comes down to aggressiveness with him but he's 23 years old he's going to figure it out and i still have him as my dark horse for the mvp you know it's still so early it's it's mid april so I have uh, high hopes for for Julio, and I think that he's going to turn turn around. It's just going to be a matter of when. And when he does, watch watch to see how uh, like guys like Ty France, like uh, Hanniger, like uh, Polanco, like J.P. Crawford, um, how these guys are made better by the improvements. Mitch, Mitch Garver, like these uh, Cal Raleigh, these guys are going to they're going to step up too when Julio becomes a guy that can't beat you. They're going to get better pitches to hit, and they're be, going to become better. The problem is when your best player struggles. And, and he can be pitched around, it, it tends to make the rest of your lineups ha- have a little more pressure on them and then vice versa. So when it rains, it pours in baseball. But 
the same thing can happen. One guy breaks breaks free, breaks everyone else free. And I think that's what's going to happen with Julio. So that concludes our show for today. I love this. I'm having so much fun. Please let me know on Twitter what you thought of the show, what else you want to hear me talk about. If you guys have ever a topic, you're like, oh, this would be great for an episode of Mayday, let me know. And also join the Discord, please, uh, and stay tuned. I hear probably in the next week or so, I will have some other ways for you to get in contact with me. Also, subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. Give a five-star review wherever you can. That's greatly appreciated. Seriously, if you want to leave a review and actually write what you like, or even leave in the reviews, hey, I wish there was more of this, I, I'd i love that either way. Any way you can, you can leave some love, I, I greatly appreciate it. Seriously, uh, from the bottom of my heart, this is so fun, and I love you guys, and I love baseball, and I'm so glad you're here. So uh, I will see you next time on May Day. And, uh, you know, take it easy and, and stay safe out there and try not to get too mad at Twitter. All right? Mm, bye-bye.